Today's passage comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 30. Hear the word of the Lord. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he began to reproach the cities in which he had done most of his deeds of power, and because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We find that we are often pretty good at putting up defenses. It is a mechanism that helps us navigate the ups and downs of life. We learn early on to shift blame to others, to deny our misdeeds, to pretend that we never fail, and to ignore the wrongs that we have committed. Perhaps we do this in response to a shame culture. We may do this with the belief that we must protect ourselves from being cast in a bad light. We may believe that we have something very valuable to lose if we should be shown up to be less than perfect. It can become a great burden for us to continue promoting this facade of perfection. It makes it difficult to hide behind a mask of righteousness when we know deep down we are somewhere less than perfect. Could Jesus be addressing this issue as he talks about taking up a lighter burden to carry? People all around Jesus had a host of arguments for why they should not be listening to him, why they should not pay much attention to his words. They had arguments against listening to John the Baptist, too, and at the two extremes of lifestyles. They critiqued John the Baptist for living too austere in existence, for giving up on all the comforts of life and relishing the joy of living, for accepting the blessings of life in God's land of promise, of enjoying food and drink and rest and comfort. And then they turned and they saw Jesus who came within the life of the common man, celebrating with them at their weddings and feasts, partaking of food and drink at 
houses of sinners and tax collectors, celebrating the joy of living with people and participating in their anxieties as well. And they compared Jesus to John and said, well, this one is nothing but a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors, prostitutes, of sinners, of those who carry, care nothing for the finer things of God's law and instruction. Jesus understood that these arguments were attempts to protect these arguers from dealing with the issues that both John and he raised. They didn't want to have to deal with the critiques of John, the teachings and critiques of Jesus about the excesses and injustices of society. But as they had no real argument against John and Jesus' words, they attempted to hide behind ad hominem attacks, attacking the person, the messenger, and shrugging off the message. You see, John understood the injustices, many of the injustices of Jewish society. He, understand, he understood that they were failing to live up to God's demands to love one another with sincerity. Jesus likewise pointed out how society failed time and time again to honor God by loving one another as equals. He cast the Samaritan as the hero in his story about what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves, calling out the people for their xenophobia as an excuse not to love one another. He attacked the amassing of wealth and called people to account for dealing with the needs of the people all around them and accepting them as brothers and sisters, as children of God, loved by the heavenly parents. He called them to account for the ways that they followed rite and ritual and heritage and tradition while ignoring the principles of God's will for the people. He called them out on violent masculinity as he discussed their ways of using divorce in a manner that made violence against women, a thing of norm. He addressed all sorts of societal ills and systemic problems in his society, calling people to do better, to live according to what they knew God had called them to do. And the people were uncomfortable with that message. You see, they knew they were not perfect. We all know that we're not perfect. I am not perfect. We will never become perfect. And we understand that God offers grace and forgiveness to us in the midst of our imperfections. But these critics of Jesus and of John were focusing not on the understanding that we are all imperfect, rather they were attempting to protect themselves and to protect unjust structures, protect the unjustifiable in order to keep from having to address the problems in their midst. I cannot love my neighbor while I am looking down on my neighbor. As John's epistle puts that I cannot love God and hate my brother. I cannot discriminate against someone and claim to love them as myself. I can't allow for injustices to go unchallenged and pretend that I follow Christ 
who called me to give answer to the injustices all around us. When Jesus talks about coming to him and embracing an easier burden, an easier yoke, it's because the people around him were trying to belong to God while propping up and defending indefensible systems that ignored God's commands. I cannot be faithful to God while I am being dishonest with my neighbor and in my relationships with my neighbor. I cannot embrace all the goodness God has for me and all those around me while I cling to notions that are unjust in themselves. And what happens is that I create a burden for myself I was never meant to carry. I cannot justify the indefensible and not believe that it is a burden too heavy for me to carry. For as I see the impact of injustice on my life, on the life of my neighbor, on society around me, I have the option either to call it out and to challenge us to do better than we have so far done, or I could try to ignore it, or I can try to justify it, to protect it, to defend it against all criticisms. And that simply will not let me sleep at night. It will not give me the rest I need. It will not free me to love my neighbor as Christ Jesus has taught me to do. You see, the gospel is indeed simple. It is restful. It is easy. As long as we're not trying to defend so many systems that militate against the gospel of Christ. Love one another. Care for one another. Treat one another as fellow citizens of the reign of God. Embrace one another. Cry with those who cry. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Celebrate with those who are celebrating. And lift up the fallen. Feed the hungry. Care for the poor. And embrace those who have been cast aside as worthless. Those are not really such hard things to do if we can let go of the burden of defending priorities and values that militate against them. See, that's the biggest problem we have. There are all sorts of good and great and wonderful things around us that we can celebrate. We live in a country that landed people on the moon's surface. We live in a, a nation that has advanced so much good in the world. And we can celebrate that good. And yet we must also recognize with eyes wide open that the same country, the same nation, even as ourselves, is far from perfect. No one expects it to be perfect. So let us celebrate the good, the positive, and the wholesome, all the while seeking to bring us onto a better course, one that elevates the lowly, that lifts up the fallen, 
that heals wounds that have been broken, that offers love and acceptance to all people, that embraces the common good as an expression of the love of God in Christ Jesus. That makes life a whole lot more pleasant for ourselves. It makes it a whole lot more pleasant for those around us and is a much smaller burden to bear as we take stock of the fact that we are fallen creatures, forgiven by God, and yet called to become more than we would normally settle for. Such is the challenge of the gospel, to lay aside the indefensible and simply embrace what is good and wholesome, striving toward becoming the people God has called us to be. And in so doing, the world around us is also transformed. A life that is much easier, a burden that is much lighter than attempting to defend and mask the indefensible, covering it over to pretend it's not there.